Nothing could have been more relaxed that Tuesday afternoon. The 5th were settled in. More supply ships had arrived in the estuary next to us, bringing in more men and more weapons for them to use. Men even took time off to fish for a change of diet. But then came the attack. So sudden, so unannounced, we knew nothing until we saw the black smoke billowing out of the landing ship, Sir Galahad. And then the first signs of a fire aboard St. Tristram nearby. The attack happened so fast, there wasn't even time to think of taking cover. And as the ships were hit, many men aboard hadn't even time to pull on their anti-burn masks to save themselves from the heat flash as the bombs exploded. Many were brought ashore with dreadful burns. The two landing ships, Sir Galahad and Sir Tristram, were bombed within 200 yards of each other as they were unloading supplies of ammunition and of men. They were in a narrow estuary at Fitzroy, leading off from Bluff Cove. The men had come to join the rest of their brigade here at Fitzroy, only seven miles from Stanley. Sir Galahad had anchored only a few hours before, and the men were waiting for landing craft to come and get them. One hour later, and most of the men would have been safely ashore in their trenches. Our air defence missile, which most Argentine pilots respect, had come off the ships in the morning, but was still being set up on the hillside overlooking the estuary. Had the Argentine planes come just that one hour later, Rapier would have been ready for them. As it was, the Skyhawks came in to attack and were out again with our gunfire chasing them too late. The bombs hit Sir Galahad aft through the engine room and accommodation sections. I watched from the shore less than 400 yards away and felt the impact on the ground below me as the hold full of ammunition exploded. Shells, guns, missiles. Bullets came from their ammunition boxes exploding in the heat, whistling and whirring past us. We could see them coming by the red traces. I saw hundreds of men rush forward along the decks across the hold, pulling on their life jackets, pulling on their survival suits. Some, the ship's crewmen, just off watch, pulling on their shirts and trousers. Men were trapped on the wrong side of the fire, and not knowing what else to do, they jumped overboard, the flames spreading around them. I saw men swim underwater away from the ship to avoid the burning oil. And as they surfaced, I watched other men men who were safely away forward of the flames risk their own lives jumping into the water with life jackets to save those men swimming below them. Inflatable rubber life rafts, bright orange, were hurled over the side. Some immediately burst into flames as debris from the explosions hit them. The strong wind gusting now fanned the fires, enormous fires, as the fuel tanks exploded. The ship was half enveloped in black thick smoke now, but the Royal Navy Sea King and Wessex helicopter pilots and their crews ignored the fires, they ignored the explosions and the ammunition erupting around them, and flew their machines into the smoke to lift the queues of men waiting below them. The helicopters waited in turn, steady in the air, to move in once the one in front of them had moved away, to winch the men off. I watched one pilot steer his machine slowly and deliberately into the black air and hover, completely blinded, enveloped in the smoke. And then we saw his crewman winching down a line to pick a man out of the sea. Three times that winchman went down and three times he brought men up, up into the blackness that covered his helicopter. I saw another helicopter almost touch the water its rotor blades seemed to be spinning through the flames to pick up a man in a bright orange survival suit who was clinging to the anchor chain. Lifeboats were launched from Sir Tristan, the other ship, whose crew seemed to be containing their fire, and these boats, under power, began taking some of the rubber life craft in tow. Others began drifting, though, taken by the wind sometimes away from the inferno, but then suddenly towards it. Pilots in the helicopters saw this, and immediately four of them 
took their machines to the rear of the ship by the flames, came down low, and using the downdraft of their rotor blades, slowly began to push the rubber dinghies away. And slowly, yard by yard, each helicopter taking care of one dinghy full of men, they pushed them safely onto the beach. There was much heroism at Fitzroy, but this single tribute must be paid to the helicopter pilots and their winchmen who saved so many. The casualties and survivors, many suffering from shock, many who had heard their own friends screaming in the locked dormitories, unable to get out, were picked up from the beach by soldiers who had run from their trenches to help. Dozens of soldiers waded out into the freezing water up to their chests in it to pull men to safety. I watched soldiers struggling in the water, picking the injured out of the life rafts and carrying them on their shoulders back to the shore and then go back again for more. Others were helped and carried up the steep slope of the beach to the waiting armoured cars and the light tanks. Some were helped inside, others were so badly injured, strapped tight to the stretcher that they had to be lifted on top of the tanks and driven to the field hospital. From Fitzroy, after emergency treatment, they were flown by helicopter to the field hospital at San Carlos Water, and then onto the hospital ship Uganda. The Chinese crew, the cooks, the laundrymen, the stewards on these Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships were badly burnt, the bomb exploding in their quarters. They are normally the most cautious of all aboard these ships, the first to put on their anti-flash units, their hoods and their gloves. But no, they said, we knew nothing, we heard nothing. There was no warning, just a blast. And then we saw men with skin dripping from their heads, from their faces. It was a day of tragedy, but I vouch it was a day of extraordinary heroism and selflessness by every man who witnessed it. <laughs> 